with a 10th 2. X-Men United I'm faced with a potentially thorny problem, causing me to offer what amounts to two reviews in one. The first and by far easier review concerns the movie on wholly surface level, as a rousing action-adventure comic book blockbuster. On that score, X2 is the rarest of rarities, the sequel that is better than the original. As such, it restores my faith in comic books broad to the screen, no easy feat after the stunningly mediocre Daredevil. The film is big and constantly clever, with a seemingly effortless make the quality about it. Characters are generally well defined and the performances are hard to fault. There's no denying that Ian McKellen's Magneto steals the show every time he's on screen, with Patrick Stewart's Dr. Xavier seeming a big colorless by comparison, but then Magneto's the far more interesting character, still, it's McKellen and not the character who creates what can only be described as the truly majestic feeling in the sequence where he breaks out of his plastic prison. The effects are excellent, a few of them even breathtaking. As pure entertainment, X2 is far and away the best film yet released in 2003. It's something you don't often encounter, a heavenly hyped movie that actually lives up to the ballyhood. Now, that's the simple writing of the movie, and if that's all you want to think about, stop right here and just go see it for its own sucker. I've been involved in the world of horror slash scary fi slash fantasy phantom far too many years not to know that any suggestion that a genre film has a political or social subtext is enough to cause some fans to get very worked up and even resentful. However, X2 is considerably deeper than its surface, and eerily relevant at this moment, and part of the deck carries a gay subtext. This should surprise no one, since both director Brian Singer and Michelena themselves stand your horror, science fiction and fantasy have long been the special provinces of people who are in some way different, that's a given. The appeal of this archetype is immediate and obvious, and such characters can be found in just about every genre film from the horror classics of James Whale to 1940s pop culture artifacts like the Wolfman, if ever a character was meant to appeal to an awkward adolescent, it's Lon Chaney's Wolfman, to modern films like those of Tim Burton, who virtually turn the idea into a cottage industry. The notion of those who are outside mainstream society in some manner, and are almost invariably misunderstood, has always been inherent in Marvel Comics, something probably exacerbated by their position as the underdog to DC Comics. Considered the biggest action hero, Spider-Man, who is, until his transformation, the much put upon the geek. However, X-Men is probably the comic's strongest statement on the persecution of those who are different. The original X-Men contain the seats that blossom here into a much larger work, in both the figurative and literal sense, X-2 is 40 minutes longer than the first film. The theme of the film is self-evident from its own advertising. The time has come for those who are different to stand united. This certainly has a straightforward, broad appeal to anyone who feels outside the accepted norm. Are you listening, Senator Santorum? But the film itself creates something more specific from the idea. The very fact that the mutants' powers usually evidence themselves at puberty is suggestive. The first film also presented the idea of mutants being persecuted by a world that feared them simply because they were different, and it included the concept of a mutant registration act to governmental program to keep track of them. X2, however, presents us with a slight variation. This plan is being pushed forward by the character General Striker, Brian Cox, who went into a seeming necessity by staging mutant terrorist activities. Striker has personal reasons for wanting to do this, namely, that his own son is a mutant whom the General had hoped Xavier Stewart could somehow turn normal, instead of accepting and nurturing the young man. Striker wants to demonize the X-gene that causes these variants, simply because it's abnormal. The film also includes a key scene in which a mutant teenager in effect comes out to his parents. The responses are clearly patterned on a strange coming out, complete with shocked and disturbed parents, have you ever tried not being a mutant? And a transparently disgusted brother. It could be argued, I suppose, that this could be applied to any announced difference, but somehow I don't see it working with anything like, Mom, Dad, I have to tell you I'm a philiclist. The scene leaves little room for doubt about subtext. A later, seems the demonic-looking, but ironically pious, Nightcrawler, Alan Cumming, marveling at the ability of Mystique, Rebecca Remage and Stamos, to appear any way she chooses, and he asks her, if you can appear like everyone else, why don't you? To this, the normally blue-skinned Mystique responds, why should I have to? This may not only be a strong refutation of the don't ask, don't tell idea, but it too fits neatly with the idea that we're to find so long as they don't say anything about it. 2. McKellum can hardly be accused of playing magnet tools anything other than elegantly campy, his line to Rogue, we just love what you've done with your hair, seems too close for coincidence to dialogue concerning Elsa Lanchester's coy for Bride of Frankenstein from McKellane's performance as James Whale in Guts and Monsters. Make of this what you will, or what you won't.
Yet it seems undeniable to me that the subtext is there, though how's the arousing adventure fantasy and finally emerging as a broad-based plea for tolerance for anyone and everyone who was in any way different from the norm. Not a bad accomplishment for a movie that could have easily been nothing more than a mindless getting ready for the new X-Men Origins, Wolverine movie. I decided to stop by and read what you thought of the previous X-Men films. I remember the first two movies being a pretty big deal at the time. They'd eventually take a backseat to Spidey and Batman in popularity, and now it feels as if the first two movies are criminally underrated. After Hellboy 2, I've always felt that it was the best comic book movie produced so far, but I'd forgotten about X2Y. The awful third, X-Men. How to kill a franchise there is a trend you'll notice in every superhero trilogy. The first two movies are usually good, if not great. But when it comes to number three, it all goes to hell. My take on this is because the second movie, where in the comic book universe the sequel usually bests the original, makes so much money for the studio, that they take the third movie and make it a cash cow. I'm still waiting for the comic book slash superhero trilogy where all three films are respectable. Is it possible for Nolan to pull it off? The problem with Batman is with the title character himself. In all the Batman movies, Bruce Wayne only seems to shine and develop in the first movie, before the more colorful villains completely dominated the future sequels, forcing the Dark Knight to take a back seat. We will just have to wait and see what Nolan will do.